smiled at Eslov and said, Go away, or I'll hit you. Eslov hurriedly left the butcher and went to a nearby tavern. The tavern keeper had been a former valet in the king's court and knew that the boy was, by right, a prince. Many times he had seen the poor ragged lad in the streets and sighed at the way fate had treated him. May I have something to eat? Eslov asked the tavern keeper. I'm very hungry. You're lucky I didn't. I don't cook you up and eat you, replied the tavern keeper. Eslov hurriedly left the tavern. <laughs> for the rest of the day, the boy approached the good citizens of Erlgard begging for food. One person had thrown something at him, but it turned out to be an inedible rock. As the night fell, a raggedy man came up to Eslov, and without saying a word, handed him a piece of fruit and a piece of dried meat. The lad took it, wide-eyed as he devoured it. He thanked the man very sweetly. If I see you begging on the streets tomorrow, the man growled, I'll kill you myself. There are only so many beggars we of the guild allow any one down and you make it one too many. You're ruining business. It was a good thing Esna Farrell knew how to run. He ran all night. And uh, Esna Farrell's story is continued in the book Thief. So we are now going to read the book Thief. What did you think of uh, that one? I have never read that before and I found it really interesting actually. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Feet. 
direction. You don't know how to fall, boy, called out a young Khajiit, but a few years older than Eslop, thin but muscular, graceful in the slightest movements. If you don't, you should just climb down here and take what's coming to you. It's idiotic to break your neck when we just give you some bruises and send you on your way. Of course, I know how to fall, Eslop called back.
Beautiful. 
lost. By pure instinct, I found myself placing the disc on my heart and whispering, Bala. A momentary chill filled my chamber. My breath hung in the air in a mist before dissipating. Frightened, I dropped the disc. It took a moment before my reason returned and with its inescapable conclusion. The artifact could fulfill my desire. Until the morning hours, I tried to raise my mistress from the chains of oblivion, but it was no use. I was no necromancer. I entered in thoughts of how to ask one of the magisters to help me, but I remembered how Magister Ilther had bid me to destroy it. They would expel me from the guild if I went to them and destroyed the disc themselves, and with it, my only key to bringing my love to me. I was in my usual semi torpid condition the next day in classes. Magister Ilther himself was lecturing on his specialty, his glow of enchantment. He was a dull speaker with a monotone voice, but suddenly I felt as if every shadow had left the room, and I was in a palace of light. When most persons think of my particular science, they think of the process of invention, the infusing of charms and spells into objects, the creation of a magical blade, perhaps, or a ring. But the skilled enchanter is also a catalyst, and the same mind that can create something new can also provoke greater power from something old. A ring that can generate warmth for a novice on the hand of such talent can bake a forest black. Did that man chuckle? Not that I'm advocating that. We'll leave that for the school of destruction. That week, all the initiates were asked to choose a field of specialization. All were surprised when I turned my back on my old darling of the school of illusion. It seemed ridiculous to me that I'd ever entertained an affection for such superficial charms. Oh, my intellect was now focused on the school of enchantment, the means by which I could free the power of the disc. For months thereafter, I barely slept. A few hours a week, I spent with Bratzniki and my statue to give myself strength and inspiration. All the rest of my time was spent with Magister Ilther, or his assistants, learning everything I could about enchantment. They taught me how to taste the deepest levels of magicka within a stored object. A simple spell cast once, no matter how skillfully and no matter how spectacular, is ephemeral, the present, what it is and no more, sighed Magister Ilther, but placed in a home it develops into an almost living energy, maturing and ripening so only its surface is touched when an unskilled hand wields it. You must consider yourself a miner digging deeper to pull forth the very heart of gold. Every night when the laboratory closed, I practiced what I had learned. I could feel my power grow with it, the power of the disc, whispering, Bala. I delved into the artifact, revealing every slight nick that marked the runes, and every facet of the gemstones. At times I was so close to her, I felt hands touching mine, but something dark and bestial, the reality of death, I suppose, would always break across the dawning of my dream. When it came, an overwhelming, rotting odor, which the initiates in the chambers next to mine began to complain about. Uh, something must have crawled into the floorboards and died, I offered lamely. Magister Elther praised my scholarship and allowed me the use of his laboratory after hours to further my studies. Yet no matter what I learned, Bella seemed scarcely closer. One night it all ended. I was swaying in a deep ecstasy, moaning her name, the disc bruising my chest when a sudden lightning flash through the window broke my concentration. A tempest of furious rain roared over Mirkorup. I went to close the shutters, and when I returned to my table, I found that the disc had shattered. I broke into hysterical sobs, and then laughter. It was too much for my fragile mind to bear such a loss after so much time and study. The next day, and the day after, I spent in my bed burning with a fever. Had I not been at a major's guild of so many healers, I likely would have died. As it was, I provided an excellent way for 
is so incredibly sleepy. 